Hello everyone, Dr. Alex Vasquez here, and today's conversation is going to start a tutorial in reading science beyond the headlines. And today we're going to focus on a recent Harvard newsletter coming out of Harvard Medical School. This video and the transcript will eventually be posted at ichnfm.org forward slash public. That's where I'm going to start archiving some of these videos and their respective transcripts. This video is actually going to kind of initiate a new program on critical reading and critical thinking that I will develop over the course of this year, 2019. So you'll see that information in the near future if you continue to follow these videos. Today's presentation is going to be a bit casual. I perform several different varieties of videos. One is best possible. Number two is a standard studio recording. Number three is what we're doing right now, which is an office recording. And then category number four, I typically don't do. Making videos that discuss science is quite a bit more complicated than the final products would have you believe. For example, level two videos, which is what I usually do, a standard studio recording, these typically take one hour of video editing per minute of finished video. So that doesn't include the actual recording, and it doesn't, of course, include the preparation, including time to review the material, source articles, and study sufficiently to have a valuable perspective. What we're trying to avoid is the read and repeat that we commonly see in today's news and conversations. And you're going to see that uh, exemplified in my critique of this Harvard Medical School newsletter. So this was published in 2019 online from Harvard Health Publishing, Harvard Medical School, Dr. Deepak Bhatt, was the principal investigator of the Reduce It trial, which we will also take a quick look at. And as they say here, with funding from the study sponsor to the medical school. So typically, drug companies will pay a medical school to perform some research. So the money may or may not directly go to the principal investigator, but it gets kind of shuffled through the school. And that's how medical schools make tons of money, is by putting their name on whatever study, because that, of course, gives the study some authority. It comes from a university, so people think it's clean and doesn't have conflict of interest. But the conflict of interest is actually quite obvious, because if a drug company is paying a medical school, and they're paying that medical school to produce a certain outcome, then, you know, the school is basically functioning as an advertising agency. So that's my commentary and opinion. Let's take a look at the details of this article. If you think this news is valid simply because it comes from Harvard Medical School, then you've kind of duped yourself already. This is what's called the authority fallacy. When we study logical fallacies, one of them is called the authority fallacy or the source fallacy or the genetic fallacy. And that is the tendency that people have to believe in something simply based on where it comes from. So if somebody reads an article from the New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA, uh, a lot of times, and I'm specifically speaking of doctors here, a lot of times they read that without much critical thought because they think, well, it's gone through the quote-unquote peer review process and it's published in a major journal, therefore it has to be at least reasonable or accurate. And I'm here to tell you that that's absolutely not the case. These major headlining medical schools and journals and medical societies for that matter, commonly publish absolute garbage that a really good teacher wouldn't even accept in a graduate school or maybe even an undergraduate level course. So, you know, to, to see an article published in JAMA or The Lancet or the British Medical Journal or New England Journal of Medicine and say, okay, well, I'm just, I'm just going to take it at face value because of its location, that's, that is itself a logical fallacy. It's called the authority fallacy, as I said before. So uh, let's not fall into that trap. So uh, don't think that this is good simply because of its source. The study sponsor, as they stated, quote unquote, study sponsor, was actually a drug company. So, you know, they had the option to say that. They, they didn't have to say funding from the study sponsor to the medical school, which sounds pretty clean. Uh, they could have said a drug company with a financial interest in this product gave us money to produce this paper. That would have been perhaps a more clear way of talking. Uh, they describe fish oil as a drug, but fish oil isn't a drug. 
Uh, fish oil comes from food. That's why it's called fish oil, uh, even though they tried to avoid using that term. They also described this product as prescription strength, which is another, uh, if I may say so, it's kind of misleading. Uh, I have to I have to say that it's kind of a stupid thing to say, actually. Nothing is prescription strength unless it is prescribed and taken at a high dose. So uh, if I say, or if we say, as they said in this article, this is that the dose of this is a prescription strength fish oil, that's a really dumb thing to say because the product isn't inherently prescription strength unless you dose it what, is, what does prescription strength mean anyway? It just means it's a higher dose. Well, we select the dose. The dose isn't selected by the product. It's not an inherent quality of the product. So it's not a prescription strength drug because first of all, it's not a drug. It's a natural product. Second of all, it's not prescription strength unless we dose it at prescription strength. So what they used here was four grams per day of this fish oil product. That doesn't make it prescription strength. We could have easily, easily accomplished the same thing with over-the-counter fish oil. So we could take over-the-counter fish oil in high doses and say that that's prescription strength. So the terminology that they're using in this article, which I think is rather embarrassing coming from uh, theoretically one of the better schools and universities in the United States, it's mis this is all misleading. So, you know, let's just use language for what language presumably is supposed to be used for, and that is communication. So we could start this article by communicating clearly. Instead of saying study sponsor, we could say a drug company that makes the product being tested and that has a financial interest in the product. Fish oil is certainly not a drug, and prescription strength is a meaningless term in this context. So what they did here, if we look at the research that was published in 2018, a lot of, or I should say several meta-analyses were published discussing the use of one gram per day of fish oil. And then at the end of the year, they published this study that we're gonna look at using four grams per day. Well, obviously four grams per day is going to have more of a dose response relationship than is one gram per day. Also, in the studies where they used one gram per day of fish oil, they also used one gram per day of olive oil, which completely invalidates those studies because olive oil is potently anti-inflammatory and cardioprotective. And that is what they were seeking. That's the benefit they were seeking from fish oil in those studies as well. So they used a fake placebo in those studies in order to minimize the differential or the relative risk that might have made fish oil look good. So in my opinion, those studies were designed to make fish oil look bad because they used an active placebo. And when I say active placebo, I have to, of course, use air quotes on that because a placebo by definition has to be biologically inert and neutral. So the use of an active placebo means that it's not a placebo, whether that activity is positive or negative. So moving on to my next comment here, uh, I considered this again from Harvard Medical School to be an embarrassing lack of critical thought with regard to with regard to their adoption and misuse of the term placebo when discussing mineral oil, which is neither inert nor benign. So in the in my previous comment, point number four, what I stated was that in the comparison studies, they compared fish oil against olive oil, looking for a cardioprotective anti-inflammatory effect. They found that the difference was not significant. And I would say, well, of course, that's to be expected because both of those products are anti-inflammatory and cardioprotective. Now, in the study that we're kind of looking at and trying to focus on here, what they did is they compared high dose fish oil. Okay. So we've already changed the game. We were comparing one gram per day and now we're looking at four grams per day and typically in in pharmacology and in therapeutics what we typically expect to find is what's called a dose response relationship so that means the more that you give the more the effect is uh, and i think most people understand that intuitively so what they did in this study that we're discussing here is they used higher doses they used four times the dose so you could say 400 percent more 
But they also compared it against mineral oil, and they called mineral oil a placebo when, when for me and for anybody who reads science, mineral oil is not a placebo. So again, this is misleading language, and I have to say it's done intentionally because these people have to know what they're talking about, or at least they have the, they have the obligation to know what they're talking about if they're going to put out news like this that's going to be read by millions of people. So mineral oil is very clearly not a placebo. I have some commentary here, but let's take a look at the actual source articles that are providing kind of the foundation for this conversation. So here is the original article that we are focusing on in today's conversation. This comes from Harvard Health Publishing, Harvard Medical School, and they brand themselves as trusted advice for a healthier life. You can see that this was made available on February, in February of 2019. And you see the headlines there. We're going to look at another version of the article. Let's just take a look at this PDF really quickly. And nothing else to look at. So let's look at my kind of commentary article, my commentary copy. So, like I said before, they call this prescription strength omega-3 fatty acids. It's not prescription strength unless we make it prescription strength. So, the same could have been accomplished with an over-the-counter uh, fish oil product. Uh, prescription is unnecessary, and prescription strength is meaningless. So, I just don't like when people or organizations misuse language. Uh, they call it a drug here. It's obviously not a drug. It's derived from a natural product that doesn't make it a drug. Uh, unless they want to control the sales and, and distribution and availability of that, then they can call it whatever they want, but it's still not a drug. Uh, look at what they say here. Highly purified fat from fish. Well, why not just say fish oil? That's what people are accustomed to hearing, and that's what they use. Nobody goes to the health food store or to their nutritionally oriented doctor and says, give me fat from fish, they say, give me fish oil. So they're just trying to use a different combination of language here to kind of avoid the topic. Highly purified fat from fish, just say fish oil, please. Not necessary to dance around the language. Uh, high doses of EPA, dramatic drops, icosapent ethyl, again, Let's just call it what it is. Let's just call it fish oil, please. Uh, even if it is altered and so-called purified, it's, it is ultimately still EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid. That is the omega-3 fat famously found in fish oil. Fatty acid, I should say. Uh, new results will likely spur much broader use of the drug. Okay, well, it's nice of them to tell us what their intent is, and that is to likely spur much broader use of the drug. Uh, some negative research has come out lately on statin drugs and aspirin. So, of course, cardiologists and other physicians, family medicine, internal medicine especially, are scrambling to, they need a product to sell. So, if we can't recommend low-cost aspirin and now the statin drugs have taken a bad hit in the research, uh, deservedly so, uh, then, you know, these doctors have to have a new something new. They have to have something new. And so this, this could be the something new. Icosapentethyl, a drug. No, again, it's not a drug, but they keep repeating that term. Uh, made from highly purified, a highly purified form of fish oil. Uh, just call it fish oil. We don't have to go through all this linguistic gymnastics. Two placebo. Uh, a lot of these patients were taking statins. A lot of them had diabetes. They took four grams per day of the drug against a look-alike placebo containing mineral oil for five years. All right. All right, students. Let's, let's think now. Let's think like we're in school. Let's think like, like we're in graduate school. Let's take off the blinders and actually look at the information here. So four grams per day of uh, let's just say purified fish oil, uh, maybe even concentrated fish oil, but ultimately it's EPA, like I said before, against placebo mineral oil. So the question that you should ask yourself if you are a critical reader and a critical thinker is, is this legitimate to say that placebo, which by definition means it's biologically inert and neutral, does that characterize mineral oil? And my answer is no. We'll look at that in just a moment. 
Uh, other details here. Only available by prescription. Well, of course, that's the ultimate plan. And no other, no other really important news here. So let's take a look at another article. Let's just talk about, we're going to focus in on, on the mineral oil placebo. So we're going to look at this article from Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, 1947. And the title of this article is The Effect of Mineral Oil. Ingestion of mineral oil by human beings will prevent a rise in blood carotene consequent to simultaneous intake of foods rich in carotene. So basically, mineral oil is known for more than 50 years, almost 70 years. Mineral oil has been known to block nutrient absorption, especially anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and cardioprotective carotenoids. And this occurs within 15 days. The study that we're talking about, which is making headlines, was for five years. So in 15 days, patients experience a reduction in anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, cardioprotective nutrient intake because of malabsorption, not because of lack of dietary intake. So the mineral oil causes nutrient malabsorption specifically of antioxidants within 15 days. So obviously over the course of five years, that would be huge. The conclusion, however, is that in man, the simultaneous ingestion of mineral oil with food prevents substantial amounts of food, carotene, a precursor of vitamin A from entering the body. Uh, another argument used in favor of using mineral oil as a quote unquote placebo is that it's not absorbed, but obviously that's not true. About one half of it went through the wall of the bowel when it was in an emulsified form. Rabbits fed mineral oil more than seven months, and again, this human study was for five years, showed numerous tiny white nodules in their intestinal wall, and vacuolization appeared in the mesenteric lymph nodes and liver. Similar changes were found in the tissues of men and women. So let me, let me read that again. Similar changes were found in the tissues of men and women who were known to have used paraffin oil, which is the same as mineral oil. Uh, in fact, 15 of 25 consecutive necropsies, so these are autopsies after death, of course, uh, the lymph nodes revealed presence of such droplets of oil in humans. So is mineral oil inert? No. Is it blocked from intestinal absorption? No. It is absorbed, and this is the data that we're looking at. The Council on Foods and Nutrition of the American Medical Association concluded in a report published in 1943 that the indiscriminate use of mineral oil in foods and cooking is not in the interest of good nutrition and that any such use should be under careful supervision of a physician, arguably not for a duration of five years. So that was a easily accessible report from the Journal of the American Medical Association. Another publication here from Journal of the American Medical Association, again, 1947, noting nutrient malabsorption and progressive weight loss, also loose stools. Another author here states, in 1913, 1914, 1915, we conducted many animal experiments with mineral oil. We fed, the, we fed animals oil and later recovered it in appreciable quantities from the subcutaneous connective tissue and fat proving that it was indeed absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. That finding, in addition to the resulting effect on sulfur metabolism, we felt might favor the growth of cancers. They never published the paper in their journal. In my opinion, prescribing mineral oil for constipation not only is stupid, but also could be dangerous. So he says that in the Journal of the American Medical Association. In my opinion, prescribing mineral oil for constipation not only a stupid therapy, not only a stupid therapy, but also could be dangerous. Well, that's an interesting statement coming out of the Journal of the American Medical Association by someone who's not only a physician, but also a primary researcher and saying that this therapy is stupid, potentially dangerous. And yet here we are 70 years later seeing a study that used this and then called it a placebo. Let's look at one more article here from, again, the Journal of the American Medical Association. See if I can provide you a date. Maybe not. Harmful effect of mineral liquid petrolatum purgatives. This is a very interesting commentary. There is perhaps no purgative 
with which the gastroenterologist is more familiar than liquid petrolatum. This familiarity results in thoughtlessness in its use. Bred through thoughtlessness and ignorance, a serious disregard for the patient's will. At this time, its chemistry is to say the least uncertain and its pharmacologic action a matter of dispute. Many investigations have been made regarding vitamin loss as a result of the ingestion of liquid petrolatum. The author goes on to say, it can now be safely asserted that liquid petrolatum, I'm just going to say mineral oil, mineral oil, because of its preferential solubility, interferes seriously with the utilization of carotene and to a lesser extent with vitamin A concentrate, as well as with fat-soluble vitamin D. This has been amply demonstrated by animal experiments and also by studies on human subjects. So it interferes with absorption of beta-carotene, vitamin A, and vitamin D. Arguably, all of those are cardioprotective nutrients and mineral oil blocks their absorption. Evidence is accumulating that liquid petrolatum mineral oil may be absorbed, producing pathologic changes in the liver and other abdominal viscera. And I'll conclude with two really interesting quotes from this article. The contents of the intestine, except for about the terminal three feet, are liquid, and the ability of liquid petrolatum, again mineral oil, to act as a lubricant for this fluid is more germane to efforts of Lewis Carroll and his Alice in Wonderland than it is to serious pharmacology. So basically what he's saying is the idea that this is some type of intestinal lubricant is just a fantasy. It would not be too unfair to say that in some respects, mineral oil has earned its niche in the section of toxicology rather than in clinical pharmacology. Let's take a look at another article. That's the original article. This is a really nice poster on logical fallacies. And the one that I mentioned previously is the uh, authority fallacy, the source fallacy, or what's called here the genetic fallacy. So let's just take a look at that so you can actually look at the details. This poster is available online for free. I invite you to take a look at it. I'm just trying to magnify it. So the genetic fallacy, as you can see here, judging something good or bad on the basis of where it comes from or from whom it comes. And as I said before, you can see here in my personal note, just like when people think that because something was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, or the New York Times, that it is therefore accurate. All of these publications are quite uh, notorious, in my opinion, and I think that would be the opinion of anybody who actually reads these publications. They're notorious for, for publishing garbage. So, again, anybody who thinks that they're going to pick up one of these publications and get the truth... Truth is not defined based on where something is published. You have to read it critically. You have to think critically. You have to have enough background knowledge to be able to do so. And at that point, you can determine if something is accurate or not. Don't let other people make that determination for you. Let's look at another independent commentary on the use of mineral oil generally and also this particular study. This is published in November 2018, and this article comes from the magazine Forbes. So let's take a look at what this author states regarding the so-called mineral oil. But what seriously bothered five of the six cardiologists I spoke to was that the mineral oil had not behaved as a placebo at all. In other studies of cardiovascular drugs, blood test results on placebo do not change. That's not what happened here. Patients who received mineral oil saw their levels of low-density lipoprotein, the so-called bad cholesterol, increase by 10%, 6% more than in the other group, according to the New England Journal of Medicine paper. What's more, the blood tests used by cardiologists also went in the wrong direction. These changes were included in a supplement to the scientific paper, but not in the study publication itself. Levels of C-reactive protein, a measure of inflammation that is used to help calculate heart risk by some doctors, in fact, most doctors, increased from 2.1 to 2.8. That is a 30% increase in the so-called placebo group. So you have an increase in a marker of inflammation in people taking mineral oil. And what we know and what I just showed you is that mineral oil blocks the absorption of nutrients that are specifically anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and cardioprotective beta carotene, vitamin A, vitamin D, and probably other carotenoids, phytochemicals, and other nutrients like vitamin E, I imagine, as well. 
It is a potential factor for driving the results that may result in exaggeration of the benefit compared to what would have been seen if there was a true placebo. And as I said before, you cannot say that mineral oil is an inert placebo. So I invite you to take a look at this article. You can find it at Forbes.com. As I commented previously, many medical journals are extensions of the marketing arm for pharmaceutical companies. So big medical journals want to publish articles funded by drug companies that will be popular and make their products look good because the editors of those big journals know that the article itself will be used as advertising. Drug companies will pay millions of dollars in reprints from the medical journal itself. You can see that very easily here. This is an article from Richard Smith several years ago in Public Library of Science Medicine. Again, the title of the article, Medical Journals are an extension of the marketing arm of pharmaceutical companies. Richard Smith was formerly, for decades, the editor at the British Medical Journal. For a drug company, a favorable trial is worth thousands of pages of advertising, which is why a drug company will sometimes spend upwards of a million dollars on article reprints of the trial for worldwide distribution. So hopefully you're understanding this by now. Drug companies pay medical schools to produce studies. Those studies, when they get published in major journals, then become a form of advertising, and the drug company then pays the journal for formal and official reprints that they can use to distribute to doctors to say, hey, look, this new product works. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It comes from Harvard. You have to believe this. And in fact, you have a responsibility to do this because we can now say that this has uh, good evidence behind it and maybe it should be the standard of care and therefore you pretty much have to do it without thinking. I mean that's the, the ultimate goal. So this is a very insightful kind of article or editorial we might say from the former editor of the British Medical Journal Richard Smith. You can get this online for free at plosmedicine.org. This was published in May of 2005. Now let's take a quick look at the study itself. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, as you can see here. Cardiovascular risk reduction with icosapent ethyl, otherwise known as EPA from fish oil, for hypertriglyceridemia. Let's take a look at some of the details here. You can see that this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine November 10th, 2018. Conclusion, among patients with elevated triglyceride levels, despite the use of statins, the risk of ischemic events, including cardiovascular death, was significantly lower among those who received 2 grams of icosapent ethyl twice a day than among those who received placebo. So 2 grams twice per day, that's 4 grams per day of relatively concentrated EPA, icosapentaenoic acid from fish oil, relative to those who received placebo. As you can see here, the study was funded by Amarin Pharma, A Marin, so Mar means C, A means without, so this is kind of like saying without the C, Amarin Pharma. Let's look at the other details. A, look, look at how they use language here. This is, it's, these things are subtle sometimes, but they're, they're effective and they're important. Each occurrence of these subtle uh, spin or shift or perspective uh, adds up after a while. So look at what they say here. A placebo that contains mineral oil. Well, why not just say mineral oil? Why not just say we used mineral oil? They're trying to distance themselves from the reality that they're also trying to communicate. So, you know, by definition, if they're going to write something, they have to communicate something. But they're also trying to distance or cloak what it is that they're trying to communicate. A placebo that contains mineral oil. Why not just say mineral oil? Don't tell me it's a placebo because I already know that mineral oil is not a placebo. So don't say a placebo that contains. Well, what else does it contain? A placebo that contains mineral oil. If, if they want to say it contains something else, then say what it is. A placebo that contains mineral oil with what? With magnesium stearate, with cellulose, with lactose with whatever popular ingredient that they might want to put in a placebo. But don't tell, don't tell me it's a placebo that contains mineral oil, which would suggest that it contains other things as well. And, and 
to me, don't don't insult my intelligence by trying to tell me that this is a placebo when we've known for 70 years that mineral oil is not a placebo. Don't try to insult my intelligence. It's ridiculous. Let's see what else we find here, if anything is interesting. Uh, my intention is not to review this article itself, but rather just kind of point out a few absurdities from it. And those are relatively easy to find. Look at what they state here, which is exactly what I had stated also. If mineral oil in the placebo, so just say mineral oil again. So if mineral oil affected statin absorption. So remember what I had pointed out earlier. We've known now for 70 years that mineral oil blocks the absorption of fat soluble nutrients beta carotene, vitamin A, vitamin D, probably other carotenoids, and probably vitamin E as well, all of which are additively and synergistically anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and cardioprotective. The possibility is rather obvious that if mineral oil is blocking the absorption of fat-soluble nutrients, it could easily block the absorption of drugs as well, and they actually address that here. If mineral oil in the placebo, just say, again, just say mineral oil. If mineral oil blocked statin absorption, don't say affected. Affected doesn't mean anything. If mineral oil blocked statin absorption in some patients, this might have contributed to the differences in outcomes between the groups. Well, of course, blocking the absorption of a supposedly cardioprotective drug would be expected to have adverse cardiovascular effects. So as I state here in my own notes, this is an example of limited logic, the appearance of thinking, but doing so within strategic limits. They could have, but chose not to pursue this line of thought, which they could have easily done by measuring serum carotenoids and vitamin D. So what they could have done in this study, what they could have done is follow the evidence that shows that mineral oil causes nutrient malabsorption. They could have looked at blood carotenoids. They could have measured vitamin A, even though that's not a very good, it's not a very accurate test. But they could have easily measured serum carotenoids and serum vitamin D in the group receiving a product known to cause malabsorption of fat soluble nutrients. Interestingly, when entertaining the idea of drug-induced malabsorption, they make no mention anywhere in this article of the term vitamin, nutrition, or nutrient anywhere in this article. So again, this is what is very common in medicine, and that is limited logic. They've written this big paper, they have supplementary materials online, and very limited despite the kind of grandeur of this article coming out of Harvard and getting published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's still limited and strategic logic. And they don't even pursue their own logic. They say, well, maybe it caused malabsorption, but what? But, but we're not going to look at that well, because they don't want to know, apparently. So that's my commentary on this, this article, kind of uh, what we might call a secondary commentary. I'm really trying to focus in on the commentary by Harvard, which I reviewed previously. So again, here you can see my summary of today's conversation. I appreciate your attention during this video presentation. Again, these will all be available on the ICHNFM.org website, and I invite you to take a look at those videos as well as download the PDF transcripts. Thank you very much.